Howdy, friends and neighbors. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is May 19th, year 2022, 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I welcome one and all in the live chat and also on the replay. I'm interested in your comments here, both in real time as well as um, once we're set in stone here. I think you're going to have a lot to mull over after this 60-minute extravaganza is complete. This is a book unto itself, and all I'm trying to do here is to plow new ground for researchers or aspiring researchers to uh, plant a seed, plant a seed of knowledge that's apart from the established, whether it's mainstream media, legacy media, academic knowledge, whatever it the same old, same, or even indie. There's a lot of, as I mentioned before, a lot of echo chamber effect in so-called indie media. And uh, it all becomes really stale and formulaic after a while. And uh, I'm all about turning over that fresh earth, always, fecundity, right? Renewal. That's how we grow. We don't want to be stunted in any fashion. So let's look at this headline. It's kind of interesting that my description here, if I may say so myself. Murder ballot of MK Naomi Judd, right? Let's take the first two words in this title, murder ballot. Well, what does that mean? Well, in country music, there's an old tradition of the murder ballad where usually it's through, told through the point of view, the POV, of a man who either wants revenge or out of jealousy, right? Some guy seeing his girlfriend or sleeping with his wife or, or you know, getting too affectionate with his, uh, you know, with the pigs, whatever it may be, or revenge is a real good one, right? It's all these great human emotions that uh, we all love and enjoy and we relish. We relish a good story. Of course, revenge, all that, all those types of uh, hostile, violent behavior is being programmed out of us right now. So it's all the more reason why we should keep it fresh, right? Like I said earlier. So that's the murder ballad. You got Long Black Veil. It wasn't written by him, but I think it was the first uh, The first recording of it was by uh, Lefty Frizzell. This, I think, in the late 50s or so. And it's been recorded, you know, covered many, many times over. It's, it's canonical, if you want to call it that. But that premise of that song is about this guy who's sleeping with the wife of a guy he just murdered, right? It's really high concept. So any of you think, you know, I don't have to apologize for country music. It's, it's, it's recognized the world over incredibly as, as, uh, as an art, whatever, however you want to define it. I don't have to apologize, but it's more than just three chords and the truth as one songwriter called it, of course, with a dominant seventh chord there at the end there. It's uh, freighted with with American and really comes from the British Isles originally with African, right? African touches, African-American, Native touches as well. And you might be surprised, and this is why someone like me is interested in this. There's a lot of Asia Pacific in country music. And I was born in Hawaii. I wasn't raised there. My parents are born and raised in Hawaii. Um, but uh, you, I could make a very strong argument stating that Without the Hawaiian influence, and of course, Spanish and Portuguese guitar, especially the steel guitar, uh, and that sort of island and overseas Imperial Navy uh, influence, there would be no modern country music, because that's where a lot of young men from the South first got their their glimpse of the wider world. They joined the Navy or the Marines. They went over to Manila Bay to fight the Filipinos in the Filipino-American War. Hundreds of thousands of Filipinos were, this is before Vietnam even. In fact, the Spanish-American War, the American-Filipino War is kind of a prelude to the later Vietnam War. And one of the, the way stations for these imperial banker-funded wars where they took a lot of uh, dirt farmers, right, the sons, the young men off the country and sent them off to go to fight, whether it's in Europe or in, or in the Philippines or in the Pacific, when we get into World War II, right, and World War I, of course. One of the way stations out there to Asia was Hawaii, as they call it. I call it Hawaii, or the natives call it Hawaii. But uh, people like Jerry Bird, that he's been living there, he's a steel guitarist, by the way, who 
went to Hawaii. For, he's from the South. He's a Southern boy. Went there and he stayed and he pioneered a whole school of steel guitar using Hawaiian melodies and harmonies and the beautiful vocals, a falsetto range uh, that uh, the Hawaiians are masters at. at uh, I mean, that was part of their own indigenous tradition, the native Hawaiian people. Anyway, I don't want, this is not about me or about the Hawaiian music. I'm saying the country music for everybody. Country music, uh, it's not about cultural appropriation. I know this is what they, what they talk about in the academic world. Uh, I call it fusion or just just the picking the best of, of everything that, that's out there in the world that's created by just everyday humanity, right? And this is all to say that this is really the the tap roots of one Naomi Judd, right? Uh, this really deep uh, connection with the human experience going back generations. It's just, it's just in America alone, let alone her family uh, back in the British Isles there, you know, they might've been Welsh. I'm not really sure. Um, but um, all that migrated with them uh, into the uh, colonial period. Right. And a lot of them moved out into the Appalachians and said, Hey, okay, we're going to start anew. No more Kings, no more Queens, no more Dukes, no more Earls. We're sovereign people. As Jimmy Martin calls it, he's a country uh, musician, by the way, and writer. Jimmy Martin, there's a great documentary on him, by the way. One of his albums called Freeborn Man. He's a freeborn man. That's how he lives his life. He just wants to be left alone. Don't let, you know, the government intrude on his life. He just wants to go out with his dogs and go hunting and fishing and, and singing and, and writing songs, of course. And by the way, he's hugely popular. And I think um, this documentary is a... I think he said something like his, because uh, he had gone out of favor, in favor of the new Nashville, which I'm going to talk about, by the way. People like him, who was rooted in the old school country music, were being pushed out. And the new country, represented by your Tony Browns, he's that kind of devilish looking guy that I put on my Facebook, right? He's a, it's not me. This he's he's been arrested a couple times for domestic abuse. He's he's a really bad character, but no one's in Nashville going to say anything about him because they owe their livelihood to Music City, USA. So Tony Brown ain't going. You know he's he's untouchable. Uh, but I'm not in the business. I don't hope to be in the business. I'm in nobody business but my own business. I'm an independent, freeborn man, just like Mr. Jimmy Martin. All right. So you can see, I un I feel the ethic. I understand. I think I understand it. <laughs> I want to live it. I want to learn it. Uh, and you may not think someone, you know, I was born in Hawaii, but I was raised in Southern California, but I was raised just one city down in Anaheim from Fullerton, California, where they made Fender guitars. This is a Telecaster. You see country music. This is the instrument they use. I bought this for $125 with my dishwashing money when I was 16 years old. And I still got this guitar. And it's worth thousands now. <laughs> the best purchase I ever made. Oh, this is a fine. It's still my favorite guitar uh, of them all. One day I'll learn how to play it. <laughs> but my friend, uh, high school friend, Bruce McCurdy, who was in a band, uh, they were called the Mustangs. And he had a Fender Mustang. And I, that's what I wanted. I had this really beautiful four-colored Fender musical instruments catalog that I would drive over to the Fender factory in Fullerton and get in their new catalog. And I wanted, oh, so badly, I wanted a Fender Mustang. It cost $189.50, which is a fortune back then. So I just saved my dishwasher. But Bruce McCurdy told me, no, 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 don't get a, I have a Mustang. You don't want that. That's a beginner's guitar. Get a Telecaster. And boy, that was the best advice I ever got so far as, and I didn't really know anything about the instruments, but he was, he was a, a very good uh, uh, amateur. He played at all the school sock ops and dances and at the pizza parlors and all that. We used to follow his band. His, his older brother uh, was in the band as well. So I grew up in this, um, this environment. Of course, Southern California is a hotbed of country music because a lot of people from the South uh, came this way in order to go to the war in the Pacific, and they stayed or they w worked at the factories. And Southern California had a really robust aerospace business uh, in the 50s to the 60s. So you had a lot of people who, um, and even earlier than that, you got the quote-unquote Arkies and the Okies who 
migrated to the Great Central Valley when it was still growing food, before Sacramento had choked off productivity in our ag agricultural regions. And we're going to get it back, too. We don't care about your chemical engineering and your Monsanto and your environmental uh, regulations. We're going to bring food back to the table. It, uh, we're going to grow our own. If, if you don't want to provide, you want to choke off the supply line, yeah, you just go ahead and try it. We're just going back. We're going back to Earth, and we're going to we're going to turn it over again, fresh, right? So you can do all the little chemtrails and poison soil, whatever you want to do, stunt the growth, put the hormones in the food. We we're on your game now, and I come to this realization by by listening and being steeped into country music. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot of it is romanticized, but it's real. It comes from that that deep, deep generations, generation, generations taproot that we need to uh, reconnect with. Let's call it that. So that's the murder ballad, and the, my contention is that uh, that Naomi Judd, because most of you. Know, can see the resonance there. It's all in caps in the title, right? MK Naomi. Most of you who are who follow this show are at the advanced level and know about MK Ultra and all the different offshoots. Well, one of them was NK Naomi, right? One of the funded covert government uh, operations, and they're still going on. I don't care what Andy Jacobson says now. It's not over. It's still it's good, stronger than ever, and we got to see it rear its ugly head again a couple of years ago, and uh, they're just kind of testing the water, seeing how we're going to react. And uh, we're ready this time. We're ready for what you got the next next round. We are real ready for you. So that's MK Naomi. And I, it's a play, you know, as clever as I am, I conflate MK oh, Naomi with N MK Naomi Judd. All right. You picked it up. All right. But why is it a more than just a little play on words on my part. Why is this more than just poetic license that I am taking? Let me count the ways, ladies and gentlemen. I, I got a thesis for you. And again, it's only a thesis. We got to we got to build out this this whole interpretive scheme that I'm laying out today. It's all original. I, I don't care who how many snap experts are on tube you, whoever's out there. This is all original. Just you and you and me, all nine thousand of you out there who subscribers. By the way, if you're not a subscriber, subscribe to me. And if you're not one of my patrons, get on the Patreon so I can buy some more, you know, Winona recordings. Right? I'm I like Winona still, and I always preferred Winona. I'm sorry to tell you this, but I preferred not Winona solo than the Judds. And I haven't caught up on what she's doing recently. This is in her newer band. It's called Big Noise. And I see Derek Trucks is on it. He's uh, the son of uh, or related to uh, Butch Trucks, who was with the Almond Brothers. If you don't know who the Almond Brothers is, well, I really can't help you. But uh, anyway, at minimum, please subscribe here and, and like this and share this video and join my Patreon because you're going to get all the documents behind this talk here. You're going to get, in fact, one of my uh, friend and colleague, John O'Loughlin, he is just one of my patrons. I'm one of his patrons, too. So he saw this uh, this uh, announcement for today's talk, and I posted a document there. Government, MK Naomi, said, and says, hey, can I have a you know the full document? So I sent it to him. That's one of the benefits you will get if you're a researcher, if you're on the Patreon, you'll get some of the the uh, upstream information out of which I give these, uh, build these talks. Because I'm not just making it up as go as I go along. I am a researcher, okay? I am, that's what I did as a profession for 30, 40 years, something like that. Uh, secretly, I, of course, I always wanted to be a songwriter and um a uh, musician, but hey, it doesn't look like it's going to happen at this point. <laughs> so, all right. Um, now, first of all, let me, if I don't mean to take this, this topic in, in sort of disrespectful uh, manner, and I want to be fully cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with a real person, uh, accomplished or not, but she's a real human being. Her name, her professional name, which I'll get to in a moment, it was Naomi Judd. Uh, I am, uh, I have have seen a really disturbing trend in the so-called true crime area, and it's which is a real pop, hugely popular 
genre on iTunes and on Tube U and on Netflix specials and all that. And I'm glad I didn't jump in real quick on it because it's been overloaded in, in that whole area. I'm still, I've been writing true crime for a long time myself. Uh, but now it's a thing, just like New Order, New World Order is a thing, just like conspiracy theory is a thing now. Whenever anything's a thing, I go thong, okay? I go the other direction. But hey, even Naomi Judd said, hey, I used to sit around and watch the soap operas all the time. Now I'm just into true crime. Uh, so everybody's into it, but I'm just saying that I, that as a caveat, I don't want to trivialize her death. In fact, I think we can learn something from her life as well as her death. That's really the focus today, right? So what is the legend, the ballad, the song, the saga of Naomi Judd? And I use legend in the sense that the people in the spy world, the spook world, use the term. Legend is a backstory. It's the cover, the biographical elements that allow the agent, the implant, the, you know, the troll, whoever it is, give them a sort of a story that's credible that people will buy so they won't really uh, question what they're doing there in the classroom or in the office or or in the comment room or whatever it is. That's just, that's a legend, right? And there's a, and that's the sense I'm using here. There is a legend of Naomi Judd, and I'm going to spell it out to you right quick. First of all, her name is not Naomi Judd. Her name is Diana Ellen Judd, right? Diana Ellen is her name. So where did she get that name, Naomi? And there's so many names, female names, in the Bible. In addition to Naomi, and believe me, I went to my Bible. I, I looked it up. She's kind of, you know, she had a connection to Ruth of the Bible. I read the backstory, hoping to see if there's any sort of clue there. But she's a good person in, in the Bible, right? Uh, but where did that come from? And, and I'm not going to go heavily into her biography. You can find that on uh, Wikipedia or wherever else. But she was born in Kentucky, Ashland, you know, small town. 1946, she's not much older than me. I'm of the same generation, you know, post-war baby boomer generation. We grew up on, you know, Avis and uh, rock and roll and Chuck Berry. And you hear a lot of rock elements in, in the Judd's music. And certainly by the time you get to Winona, you hear a lot of country, what later became country rock, which is kind of ironic because the birds who I think were really um, introduced, if I could single one group out, uh, country rock, they were booed off the stage of the Ryman Auditorium back in 1968. The audience didn't want to see them hippies there. And, and you know, this is, they were still doing the old school country music and the old generation of it, even though the younger kids were, were, were in tune with the Beatles and all that. So by the time we, we get to Naomi Judd and the Judds, the new country has moved in. And also, it's not just a matter of a style. It's not just a matter of a generational shift. You also see the big money, the financing. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's some money to be made here. Yeah, this ain't just no some hillbillies, right? Listening to WSM or, you know, buying grits and, and their overall. Because that, that's the image of, of the South that uh, Hollywood and New York advertisers were giving us. when we were going, oh, yeah, the Beverly Hillbillies and... You know, I mean, he he all had some of the greatest musicians on there at the time of, of that day. And we had to sit through all this cornball humor in order to, to hear Roy Clark, who's a virtuoso of anything with strings on it. Roy Clark can play it. And he can play it incredibly well. So we had to. Um, so maybe if they ever reissue the uh, some of the some of the skits were, were OK. They were funny. But I was I was there for the music. Right. And even Johnny Car uh, John about Johnny Carson. Yeah, Johnny Carson, too. Johnny Cash had his own uh, show, which, again, was incredible. And by the way, Johnny Cash was one of the people who reached out to the younger generation and brought them on stage and gave them their respect as fellow artists. All right. So there's this whole conflicted history there. But by the time Naomi and, and Winona come, and by the way, that's not her real name either. OK, there's this is there's legend upon legend upon legend. And it's going to get deep. All right. Hang on. Hang, just stay, stay, stay with me to the end of the show because, believe me, you're going to be talking about this presentation for weeks, if not months, if not years to come.
All right. Because I, I bring it all together here. I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull it off by the time I came to air at 3 o'clock. I said, yeah, I'm ready. But Winona's real name, she was born Christina Clare, or she was christened Christina Clare Cimanella, or maybe back there they call it Simonella, but if you want to give it the Italian pronunciation, it's Ciminella, right? Christina Clare. So she took on a new identity, just like her mama took on a new identity. And to top it off, Christina Clare, who we know today is Winona, right? This is Winona. She's a mean one, right? The mean looking one. <laughs> Naomi's all the kind one. She's the nurse of the family, the registered nurse, right? Ashley, hang on. We're going to get to Ashley in a moment, all right? Because there's a whole organic connection here with what I'm dealing with that brings us to that ideologue called Ashley Judd, you know, when she was over at the Million Women's March wearing the pussy hat, saying, oh, I'm a bad, nasty woman. She's a troubled woman, you know? We should be very kind to her because... What she got herself into wasn't of her own doing. I think her mama and Mr. Chimanella is the ones that brought her into this whole world where she has to take on this lifetime persona as a social justice warrior, philanthropist, and spokesperson for X, Y, and Z extortion charity, right? That's extortion charity, right? You and me do not have to donate to these. We do not have to designate part of our salary or our wages at work in order to go to these extortion schemes, right? Whatever it, whatever they call themselves, there's a new disease every week being invented to extort and to, to, to uh, hold our emotions and our, our sympathy for people who are less fortunate than us, hold that hostage, right? That's what they do. I gave a talk on Sharon Stone. Once she has aged out of her profession, they always go to the final stage, which is spokesperson for X, Y, and Z. And we know Ashley Judd is a globalist. You know she works for the New World. She's like a mama works for the, uh, the globalist health complex in America and, of course, overseas uh, in a foreign government, right? Government Belgium, right? We're talking about the United Nations, the World Health Organization. It's all lined up there. And guess what? They use that sweet bait and the rat poison of country music in order to lure people into the trap, right? But we done sprung the trap and we not going in it, okay? We ain't going in it. We can smell evil where evil is because we're learning from the country people what's up. Right. So there's the whole legend behind it. We got Naomi and I think my again, this is a hypothesis. I think Naomi was given to her by her handlers who like a big joke at people's expense, especially us. And said, yeah, we're going to script their whole career out for her and her daughters. And we're going you know, to bring all of the folk of America because we're in a mainstream country music. Uh, it's going to be global in scope and in popularity. And we're going to make make everybody follow the Nashville, which is now cool. Back then it was you know, backwoods, right? Uh, we're going to make the world follow the lead of these celebrities as we construct them, as we design them on our orders, right? And of course, just conveniently, just prior to when she was being about to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, Naomi Judd dies. She dies at her own hand. Suicide by a gun. And guess who found her? Ashley Judd found her and said, yes, it was a firearm. She wouldn't use gun as a term. The words are very important because I'll script it out here. Everything comes out of Ashley Judd. She's an actress after all. Is scripted, right? She meets with uh, academic uh, types, right, who are in... Uh, uh, behavioral psychology, sociology, you know, the ologies, right? The people who study uh, human communities and communication. And they gave her a little file folder and they say, here, this is, this is, this is the script for this week. This is how you're going to frame the suicide of your mama, right? Naomi Judd. So, of course, she, she's not going to say, hey, we got to ban guns, right? Because she knows that's not going to have any traction because we've had years and years of people who've been trying to outlaw 
firearm and confiscate them in America. So she has to be more subtle than that. She don't even utter the, the name gun, the, the term, the word gun. She said, yes, she killed herself by a firearm. I never heard anybody say, yeah, he, can, he committed suicide with a firearm. No, this, you say he blew his, bo his brains out with a gun or whatever. You don't say firearm. That's like a marketing term. Anyway, I, I don't mean to quibble. So that's what, and that is a real name so far as I know. And she is the, bio, so far as we know, she is the biological daughter of Michael Chimanella Jr., right? And if you really want to get into it, I haven't had a chance yet. This is for you, a challenge to you. Check out who the Chimanella family is, especially Michael Chimanella Sr., all right? I haven't had a chance to do it, but I think they're probably really, really high up in organized crime. Not because they have an Italian last name. But I'm saying they're connected at the high because we know that, you know, your ethnic crime groups are by now have fused with the white shoe boys out of Skull and Bones, right? In Wall Street, the city of London. We know that. Yeah, they're with the gangsters of Marseille, to the Yakuza of Japan, to the uh, Heijin of Taiwan, to the um, different crime groups that are related to the uh uh, Communist Party of China, you got your your, your Latin drug gangs and, and the entity, you know, it's all fused together and they pretend like they're they're fighting each other, right? That's your FBI there in, in a nutshell. And I don't have to tell you that. You already know that. So I'm not really telling you anything new here. So check out who Michael Chimanella is. Anyway, what 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 went down is that um you know the story, uh uh Naomi got knocked up by her high school sweetheart first time she ever had sex i mean talk about legend <laughs> first time she ever had sex in her whole life then she came up pregnant and she was pregnant with winona and winona grew up thinking that michael chimanella jr was her daddy but no he was the guy that married winona after her original boyfriend ran away she was a senior in high school supposedly uh, and, and, you know, very attractive, very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman all, all throughout her entire life. Right. But uh, and, and, you, and I'm saying that. Right. Because it, she's going to attract attention and she's going to attract the pimpalicious type of people. They're going to she's going to run across all kinds of men who want to turn her out. They want to put her on the track, as they say in the ghetto. You know, the track, that's where the hoes go around and around. That's like called being put on the track. Uh, by the way, it's no coincidence that uh, Michael Chimanella Sr., I believe, was involved with Kentucky horse horse racing, right? And uh, I guess it's an appropriate time for me to talk about it. Hey, if you don't think there's organized crime in the South, you've been watching too many Godfather sagas. It's not just about Sicilians or Jews or, or the Russian mafia or the Yakuza or the Tongs or whatever. Have you heard about the Dixie Mafia? Well, I didn't know about the Dixie Mafia either until about 20 years ago when I when when someone rode up on the national stage. His name was William Jefferson Clinton. And then I started reading up on Arkansas, especially Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I was to learn that Hot Springs, Arkansas was the hottest resort for all the top gangsters around the world. And also criminals like Al Capone. When I say gang, I'm talking about the D.C. ones, right? the district of criminals, right? The elective officials. And we're going to get to a top level U.S. Senator elective official in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. So please hang on and indulge me right? as I trip out on my improvisation. Yeah, chorus after chorus, three chords, man. And just like a, a cloud of dust and I'm on my way. Yeah, so when Willie Jefferson came, you know, Willie Pimp came on the scene and I found out his mama was like a borderline hoe out in Hot Spring, Arkansas. I found out there was a whole scene there. And it was the place in America to go to before the Jewish mafia set up uh, Las Vegas. You know the whole story, Bugsy Siegel and blah, 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 Meyer Lansky, the, the uh, Jimmy Hoffa, the, the um, uh, Teamsters um, Union Fund, other organized crime entities. You know the backstory there. So there is a whole network that ever preceded what we obsessively see as thanks to uh, Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese and all the Italian American Illuminatus Jesuit directors who have monopolized our attention 
in their particular ethno group at the expense of the true criminality, which is in the district of uh, criminals, right? Uh, and uh, one day I will write the uh, the um, the uh, the Japanese Godfather saga parts one, two, and three, and it'll blow your mind. And it's going to include Hawaii, and it's going to include the uh, Pacific Rim area here, and it's going to blow Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, anybody else, you know, all all the true crime writers, whoever they might be, you know, Mario Puzo, yeah, all of them. Yeah, give me my publishing deal. All right. Um, okay, so you got the Chimanella connect. He's a mystery man, but you know, he's involved in the connect. By the way, you know, horse racing, boxing, guess where Cassius Clay come from? Later known as Muhammad Ali. He went off the plantation, you know, and they threw him in prison, right? To take his skills away. But guess what? He came out of prison and he reclaimed the crown as Muhammad Ali. Well, anyway, Cassius Clay come out of Kentucky. And he was owned by some white businessmen who said, okay, here's our colored boy who we're going to make a champion. You know, we're going to fix, fix the matches, whatever it is. He's going to be national champion. Cash is clay, right? That's how they do boxing. That's South still do. That's how they do show business, all right? You got it? If you want to play, you got to pay. And that includes Naomi Judd. That includes Na uh, Ashley Judd and Winona Judd. So we're talking about a microcosm of how the, the, the world really works. Okay, now I was going to go into the Nashville music industry. I had some, some econometric data. I don't want to bore you with it. You know, I, had all the, I read all the reports published and researched by the Nashville Chamber of Commerce and all the you know, Vanderbilt University business department about how much millions and tens and Hundreds of millions of dollars being poured into the local Nashville economy from the hospitality industry to the bars and the restaurants, the venues, the recording. Uh, I don't know about the prostitution and the drugs and the human traffic. I don't think that's recorded. That's probably you had probably multiply that net figure that comes out in the official report, multiply it by 10, and you'll probably get an idea of the centrality of Nashville. But as I told you before, it's by now, it's fused with a larger nexus, the network of international capital, right? In the glitzy guise of of uh, Music Row down in Nashville. And um, even since the time I, I was down there, I've been there in years. Uh, it's really, in fact, I, I doubt if I'll ever go back now because uh, I've been to Disneyland and I don't need to go back to, to if I do, I'll, um, um, it'll be on, on a professional paid uh, visit, uh, but I wouldn't spend my own money to go to Nashville now. There, there are too many tourists there, I think. Uh, but but you can find country good country music locally. I, I'll tell you what I do. I go to the Indian casinos locally here, and they you get some. And they may not be these huge uh, national acts, but you get some good music, live music. Uh, I won't even go to Las Vegas either. It's uh, it's, all, it's all going down. You know, maybe, maybe for the better. I, I really don't. Um, I'd like to visit Hot Spring, uh, you know, Arkansas. I've never been there. I just like to check it out. Just from, from when I read. Anyway, get getting back on topic here. So we're, we're not going to talk about the mega profits. Just, just take my word for it. There's a whole new stratum of, of wealth that's being generated. Of course, the lion's share has been taken away by Wall Street, the people, the institution investors that own the record companies. And, of course, over to the city of London, all the financial capitals of Europe, maybe even Japan, you know, Tokyo, Sony. You know, that's a Japanese company. I think a lot of the money goes to the, the Bank of uh, Japan centered in Tokyo. Tokyo is like uh, the city of London. It is a zone. It's like Washington, D.C. All these little financial centers have a little, their own little autonomous domain there. So that's there's Tokyo and there's Tokyo To. And there's there's London and there's the city of London. There's Washington and there's Washington, D.C. You, you get the idea? That's all part of the financial uh, system here that uh, has been set up by the blood royals here for... Um, to, to, to bleed us dry. And I don't care how high you are, you can be Naomi Judd, they're going to get you at a certain point. So, uh, but let's talk about the, the, the political aspect of the ideology. Now, I remember, and this is why all my friends used to tease me that, you know, I would listen to uh, songs like, you know, the um, 
instrumental music of Southern Appalachia or, or Sparin Young and Webb Pierce. I got all the LPs too, but I got a lot of CDs too from, from some of the material that, that's hard to find on records. Farron Young, Farron, I got, you know, I'm a big, the Wilburn Brothers, um, Evis, of course, you know, all, all the usual people, the Leuven Brothers, uh, uh, younger song, singer, songwriter, Radney Foster is one of my favorite. Uh, they got Louisiana Hayride compilations, you know, you got your, um, you got your Evis, you got your Hank Williams one, and uh, the whole crew there, Kitty Wells. You know, call per you know all of them the sun you know the sun sun records people, uh, so, but they had these certain values there. They didn't cross the line. It was about, and I'm not going to belabor the point because most of you know this already. But it's about country, love of country, love of family, love of your own community. Yeah, there's some murder ballads thrown in there for excitement, right? Love of the home, all right? Okay, that was the classic country. Then I told you there was something called new country that came in with people like Tony Brown, right? And MCA started Music Corporation of America. That's when MCA stands, which came out from L.A. And MCA, by the way, was a product of the Jewish mafia, right? Uh, Lou Wasserman, Lou Wasser, who's who's really tight with the Democratic Party on the national scale. He was a movie guy. You know, I think it was 20, 20th Century Fox, one of the big movie studios. And the movies went down as television came up, and so they moved into. And he, uh, Wasserman, by the way, was one of the lieutenants of the Capone mob out of Chicago. His boss was uh, Doc was a, a ophthalmologist by the name of. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Stein, is it, or, uh, Jewel Stein, and he has an institute at UCLA. He was a, but he was making the big money running the music corporation, booking all the bands. Some of them come down from the south, right? Some of the country bands they book in the restaurants that they own, the clubs, all mafia. It's all mobbed up here. So you see, you got you got multicultural enterprise going on at Vero. You got your Hawaiian music. You got your Jews from New York and L.A. And you got your 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 uh, Dixie Mafia from the Deep South. You got the Black uh, Freemasonic element down in East St. Louis. I mean, everybody's involved. That's why I'm so into criminality, and I think we should really encourage the, the legal criminality instead of the covert criminality, where there's something called inflation that robs us when we don't even know what's going on. Yeah. Is that a criminal act? Hey, no one's putting a gun to our head, right? Well, you got to buy that chicken, right? It's going to cost you $50 a pound, gasoline, $10 a gallon. Yeah. All right. You get my point, right? So we see a shift in the thematics of country music, which all the progressives and the leftists and your liberals, you know, even at Vanderbilt University, there's probably someone in women's studies and gender studies talking about how sexist country music is. It's so white male patriarchal and heterosexist, right? So who am I leading up to? Yeah, you got it. I'm leading up to Ashley Judd because she is the social justice mouthpiece of the South, even though she grew up in L.A. or not even in L.A., probably in Calabasas or Beverly Hills or the Pacific Palisades. And I'm saying this because she had the nerve to say, because, you know, she, she likes to be on stage and appear at the around. She had the nerve. She said she was going to run for U.S. senator. Yeah, but they uh, put out a commercial. Oh, she's a carpetbagger. Well, she's not a Kentuckian. She's an L.A. glutterati, and, you know, I'd have to agree with that. So she decided that she was not going to run for office. And we're going to talk about office holder in a moment, uh, a senator from West Virginia. All right. So we see over a matter of decades, you know, leading into the so-called new country. And that's when the rock beats start to come in there, you know, like the birds start coming in. And then now country music sounds like country rock, right? There's even something called bro music, you know, bro, it's like a country bro. And um, it's pretty off. It's pretty synthetic. Most most country music today is unlistable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's why I listen to uh, the, the class. There's some good people out there. And um, some of them, some of them are, are, you know, quite popular as well. Like Hank 3 is good, right? Hank Williams 3. 
real good. But he works for one of these giant uh, record companies. Don't don't be fooled by that. Drive by truckers, really good as well. Brad Paisley's good. He he went to college in uh, Nashville. It was I think on a scholarship done by the music community there. Incredible Telecaster player. Oh yeah, good great songwriter. I haven't seen him on his live act. I'm sure it's good. Uh, I'd rather go to small venues rather than these giant arenas. Although I have been to the Ryman Auditorium, the, the, the new one, which is huge. And that was a good show. So like a variety show. It's like every every song, there's a new act going on. I, that's, I'd like to go back to Nashville to see that. It's not in Nashville. you got to take the bus outside or a tram outside the city proper. So anyway, the it's uh, country music. The point is country music has fused with the mainstream globalist economy, the globalist uh, political ideology, most visibly in the form of Ashley Judd. Now, I had uh, pre prepared for you some graphics here, and I got to get to them because I'm running out of time as usual. But here is the uh, newly departed uh, Naomi Judd incredible artist and um, even if her legend quote unquote legend is even partially true a decent human being contributor and um but i think she was put out on the track i don't know the names of the people but she was put out there just like most that shouldn't be a surprise and as i told you before she she part of the deal was that she had to go globalist so there she is with her bestie dr francis collins and you know who he is I'm not going to utter them words. I don't want the algorithms to pick it up, but uh, he's related to a uh, historic character named Dr. Faustus <laughs> and the NIH, the National Institute of Hell, and of course the World Whore Organization and WHO, the UN. And then previously I gave a talk on Cabbage Patch Adams, right? Where's my brain? It's Robin McLaren Williams. And I said, hey, there's a whole... Uh, script that was written for for robin williams that he played out to the end and what they made him a poster child for mental health prevention or, or correction or whatever it is they exploit this so we can we can see periodically some celebrity who's going to shoot himself in the head or be suicided or overdose so to remind the public that we got to support mental health which, as you know, is not about health. It's about disease. It's about sickness. It's about engineered debility, right? Which I'm saying is being bioengineered, nanotechnology, y'all, right? Okay, this is my graphic about the business, so we won't belabor the numbers. Okay, here's where my thesis takes on another spooky dimension. Okay, this guy you don't know, right? His name's Harry Smith. Harry Smith got together, and he's a Luciferian, Harry Smith, uh, he's a Crowley, and he was an acolyte of Alistair Crowley from the late 40s through the 50s. But he also was one of the early collectors of 78 RPM records, you know, from the South. I don't know where he got them. I think he, he was probably a wealthy, a rich boy or something. But he grew up in like Port. He's from Portland, Oregon. But he hung out in, in Berkeley where you had the, you know, the beat culture and the counterculture kind of growing up there. But he had a huge collection there. And uh, he had the prescience, or his handlers had the prescience, saying hey, this is really important capital here, cultural capital that we can make money off of, and we can also shape the culture and society with the music here. But and and perhaps we can find some really beautiful woman down the road with talented daughter, and um, breed her another younger daughter with another husband who's rich. And we can create act on them, and we'll call them the judge, let's say. So Harry Smith collaborated with a, uh, it looks like he was a Sabbatean, uh, Frankist guy named Moses Ash. Moses Ash, he was a Polish Jew who was in the folk mu music business, number one. And the second, the more important part is that he was also a communist. He wrote for the Daily Worker, right? So that's where you get your Ashley Judd. The new country is a Sabbatean Frankist expression of what people like Moses Ash and Harry Smith were planning for back in the mid 50s because Moses Ash bought his collection, produced it, and they, I think they were connected to DC. This is where I think Harry Smith's biography has to go into. I think his daddy had some connections with the District Columbia. Uh, District of Criminals, and they sold that collection to the Smithsonian Institution. And today that's called the Anthology of American Folk Music. 
It came out in 1954 and recently, not well, years ago, not by now, it was re-released as, as a, I think, six CD set, which I have, by the way, and there's a 96 page book. It's well done. The, the notes were written by Harry Smith. This guy is brilliant, but he is also a Luciferian who combined with a leftist who want to figure out how they're going to get into mid, the mid, uh, the, the underbelly of America, middle America, southern America. The southern states where where true Americana still live, it still lives today. It's it's going, it's being threatened daily, right? And the judges were were groomed in order to help bring that process to a head, right? Uh, via Ashley Judd, but so they had combined forces in order to make it into a leftist project, right? Oh yeah, Appalachian coal workers, we got to go communist, we got to organize union, right? The union maids. Oh, yeah, Bloody Mate Wand, right? And you got all these film, Hollywood films, Norma Ray uh, coming out of Hollywood. And I'm not saying that labor organization, labor organizing, labor unions are inherently bad. But when you think about it in, in the longer terms of them always winding up uh, expressing what they truly are, which are organized criminal uh, extortion rackets, then you have to re rethink what the Teamsters really represent. You also have to rethink what the teachers unions uh, represent, right? Very strong. And they're the ones who are in control of the curriculum or implementing it rather. They're getting orders from people like Harry Smith or people who are housed at Columbia University Teachers College, UCLA Teachers College, or the Teachers College over at UC Berkeley who are getting their orders from the uh, from UNESCO, from the United Nations, from um, uh, from NATO, right? But anyway, here's one of the characters here, a Crowleyan Satanist, right, who had this record and combined with, Mo, and you got Moses Ash, check him out. He, he ran a label called Folk Ways. And by the way, that's where the first wave of post-war folk music came out of. There was nothing folk about it. It was synthetic. They found this guy, Robert Z Zimmerman, down in, uh, out in Hibbing, Minnesota, who came to the village, New York City, and you got Joan Baez, and you know her backstory of her father, the uh, physicist Alberto Baez. And they brought all these kids down there and said, hey, here's the American anthology of folk music. We want to get your whole generation hooked into the Appalachian, the poor white trash. That's you know their term for it. And we're going down south and we're going to organize them and make them unionize. And that's going to bring them over into the new world order by the year 2020 when we roll out our uh, the next phase of organizing. So that's Harry Smith. And here we have, guess who on the right? Ashley Judd. And that's a mama on the left, all right? So to expand on my thesis here about the connection between country music and this larger district of criminals, right? Columbia means Britain, by the way, right? Columbia University was called King's College before there was something called the American Revolution where people said, no, we're not going to work under the crown anymore. We're going to be Americans, right? Then they renamed it Columbia University. And as you know, District Columbia, Tokyo, to, City of London, right? And you got one guy there who was a U.S. senator from West Virginia. He lived to the ripe old age of 92. <clears throat> I think still to this day, he holds the record for the longest term in office of a U.S. senator. And as I get a drink of my water, I'll show you his face. That's him, his bad self, Senator Robert Byrd from West Virginia. And most people fixate on the point, oh, yeah, he was KKK and he was Imperial Wizard. And he said, yeah, the Negroes got to stay at their own side of town. And OK, true, true, true. But but even beyond that was just like a sideshow for you to just focus on that. He was a globalist and he was a New World Order character. He was... I don't know if he was Knight Templar, but but he goes back generations of these Illuminati characters. And I think he was also a bastard. There's all just like when I was talking, but since DC Andrews, I've been telling you about bastardy, illegitimacy, and, and incest and, and all of that good Americana stuff, right? And uh it's uh hey, guess what? Robert Byrd liked to fiddle around. Do you know what I mean? Yep, he was a country fiddler. 
He was the fiddler riddler. And uh, many of you are familiar with the, let's move him from the picture here. Many of you are familiar with his, um, uh, the work of uh, Kathy O'Brien, right? She did the book, uh, Transformation of America, and she talks in great detail how at a very young age she was brought into sex slavery and how the whole sex uh, trafficking and the sex industry uh, articulates with the political and banking and corporate establishment in America and the world. I mean, she didn't put it out to the being a, an international uh, system, but I think you can infer by now that, that there is that because we're, you know, we know uh, thanks to people like Kirby Summers, um, we know a lot more about uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, Robert Maxwell, and Epstein, and, and the whole international uh, connections there. So let's take a look at Kathy O'Brien's, what her comment about uh, the fiddler himself, Senator Robert Byrd. Let's see what she has to say. Island, Michigan, when I was 13 years old, that I was dedicated to the senator who had become my owner in this mind control project. That's U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd. Senator Byrd is a Democrat from, from West Virginia. And again, as you'll notice as, as I, I reveal any names, that this doesn't have anything to do with party lines. Democrats and Republicans both are involved because it's not about party lines. It's about who's for new, the new world order and who's not. Nevertheless, Senator Byrd had been in office as I've been alive. He's still in office today. He's, had, he's been a head of our Senate Appropriations Committee which means he held the purse strings of our country. He decided where money would be spent. And I know from, from having witnessed and experienced and saw so much behind the scenes that Senator Byrd was appropriating money and directions that would allow for new world order controls. Not only that, but my father, for having sold me into this project, was, was granted an a lucrative military contract for making camshafts for military automobiles and, and all. My father became extremely wealthy on his sixth grade education. Senator Byrd, as my owner, would decide where I should go, when, what operations I would be forced to carry out during the Reagan-Bush administration what places I should be taking specifically for mind control programming. Senator Byrd directed all of my activities. Okay, now just think about it. You don't have to answer now, but do you think uh, that Na Naomi Judd was brought in, because there are a number of people, not just Kathy O'Brien, uh, Kathy O'Brien, excuse me, that were involved with it, but do you think that she might have been involved thanks to uh, her, her husband, the one that married her, or whoever it might have been, I don't know. That's that's to be determined. Was brought in to uh, to execute a certain type of program there, right? And if you don't believe me that uh, Senator Robert Byrd was a fiddler, an expert fiddler, really good. I hate to admit he's 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 good, <laughs> but he even appeared at the Grand Old Opry, the old one at the Ryman Auditorium. Here he is, Senator Robert Byrd. In most ways, it was like any other Saturday night at the Grand Ole Opry, but in the air, you could feel the excitement. For the audience, it was not only a chance to see their favorite country music stars, but it was an opportunity to see a live television production. For the second time in the Opry's history, public television broadcasted the show from coast to coast. Six hours of country music at its finest. And tonight, besides all the country music stars, the Opry featured a political superstar, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd politician by trade, but a fiddler at heart. For those at the Opry House, it was history in the making. For those watching at home, it was like a dream. And for the Democratic senator from the hills of West Virginia, it was a lifelong dream come true. Jonathan Seaman, Television 5 Eyewitness News. Well, 
Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the fiddling senator. And as I was watching that, that little clip there, I was reminded that all them years ago on the Arsenio Hall show, this uh, presidential aspirant by the name of Slick Willie Jefferson comes on in the shades, rocking his tenor saxophone and plays with the Arsenio Hall band. Everything. Oh, man, he's cool. He can play the saxophone. Oh, man. And that, that's when our national nightmare commenced. We got eight years of Slick Willie and uh, Hillary, known as Billary, and then their successors. And now we're still trying to get from out under their heels, right? We got Barama, and now we got uh, uh, Sleepy Joe Biden, the illegitimate president. So, hey, if you don't think this criminality works, uh, up to a certain extent, uh, it's not going to work in the long run because we're breaking it down right now. We're showing how these different institutions and how the characters within them, how the inner game works, the real politics that you do not learn at the university. You certainly don't because they get you in on the gender politics, the racial and the transgender and, and, and all, you know, the, the usual CRT, which, by the way, your uh, bloviators like Sebastian Gorka uh, and, and, and the, uh, the auctioneer Stu Peters, that's all they can talk about, man. So let's get real. Let's, let's stop the echo chamber effect. Okay, let's see uh, our Ashley Judd here. She's a social justice warrior. She just happened to be the one to discover her mama dead by a firearm, interviewed by Diane Sawyer, who I'm going to get into in a moment, because even Diane Sawyer be groomed, right, of ABC. So beautiful in the hills of Tennessee, where the amazing Judd family has lived in separate houses but minutes apart. And through the years, they've spoken publicly about their challenging family life with a mother who was wounded by trauma and depression, but filled with dreams and drive. As we arrived, Ashley waited at the door. Good morning, my fellow Kentuckians. Her grief shared by her sister and the stepfather they call Pop. The kind of grief where the darkest heartbreak is framed by the brightest light. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mom loves it. As someone said, the size of the loss is the size of the love. Mm. And that can be infinite. And you know, my, I appreciate so deeply and really want to start by thanking everyone for their, for their outpouring of love and condolences. Okay, that's Diane Sawyer. And you notice they greet each other, hello, my fellow Kentuckian, which is great. You know, the bluegrass... The bluegrass state, fine. I love it myself. Yeah, okay. But did you know that that uh, Diane Sawyer was put on the track at a at an early age? In fact, she was a competitor in the Junior Miss competition. The, the top, the most beautiful and talented and charming high school senior in America. That's the Junior Miss pageant. This is back in 1963, and then later she was brought into network television. And uh, later she, uh, who did she marry? Was it Mike Nichols, the director, or someone like that, right? They hook, they match them up with some other uh, media figure. Uh, so here is Diane Sawyer back in 1963 on the track, right? Who knows who's behind the, the Miss America and the, you know, the Donald Trump type of stuff where they're, you know, they get, they get to be by the models and the beauty contestants, and there's all kinds of transactions going on, right, over the bodies of women's, and in some cases, chillings, and in some cases, boys. Look for Diane Sawyer. She's going to show up. This is an appearance in the pace setting civic development in Rochester, New York, the Midtown Plaza. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to show you the 1963 pageant from beginning to end. The fun, the thrills, the excitement. The day was March 9th, a pleasant, warm southern day as the first plane arrived. It seemed as if everyone in Mobile had turned out to give the visitors a big, hospitable welcome. The Azalea Queen and her court. Bands, photographers, the press and radio. Everyone was there to say hello. I'll move 
it up a little bit to see if we can see uh, Diane Sawyer coming down the gangplank here. I think she was uh, Miss Kentucky. Maybe Arizona's junior miss, Roxanne Hooper. Or perhaps Kentucky's lovely Diane Sawyer. There she is, Diane Sawyer. Oh, man. Diane Sawyer. She's had a long career. Man, she was put on the track early on. I think later on, in order to burnish her image as having some brains, she they attached her to Richard Nixon after he was humiliated out of office. She went down to the Western. I, I think it was her. She helped him uh, put his, his memoirs together. At least that's how the legend goes. We don't know for sure. But you know, I've been tracking her for, for quite a while. Not not really intentionally, just she's been on the scene a long time. But even she's got this uh, sordid backstory that uh, that helps complete this hypothesis of mine, building it out. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to consider, since it's about my time is over right now, how I bring together the different uh, Luciferian and the Sabatine Frankist, and you got your your uh, Senator Byrd and the large uh, international pedophilia rings going on and sex trafficking and Kathy O'Brien's pioneering research, which I find uh, credible all the way through and through. And she did find redemption and she made peace with herself. Her husband was wonderful, her daughters. So, you know, they, they went through a lot, uh, maybe even more than Ashley Judge, although I'm not comparing, but people do survive and can survive and not only survive, but they can prevail. Kathy O'Brien's life is, is testament to that fact. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call it a, a day. Uh, I'll be probably revisiting some of these themes here today. But um, if you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up here. Recommend this video. I think this is another legacy media to tell you the truth. This is going to add another uh, important research stream to this larger saga here. And through such efforts, along with your, yourself, your own contributions and mine, uh, we're going to build out the full saga, the full, the murder ballad of America. And uh, we, we're going to come, we're going to resurrect ourselves, right? Uh, the globalists think they have written the definitive murder ballad for the American people. But you know what? There's a whole literature about revenants. You know what revenants is? The revenant come back from the dead. Right? That's all there. There are also a lot of country music about people who come out from the grave and come back to haunt you and get justice. Right? It's called a revenant. And there was a good movie made uh, by that title. It's fairly good. But there's a whole supernatural literature. A lot of it comes from the British Isles where the, where the mountain people of Appalachia maintain those traditions. And the revenant going to get you, all right? All you district criminals, you globalists out in Belgium, right? You lackeys of the United Nations and the World Horror Organization, all of you, right? You cannot break the indomitable spirit of the American peoples, whether it's from the deep south, the eastern seaboard, the far west, and even Hawaii, right? Where country music has a very important role in the life of the people there, courtesy of the Hawaiian steel guitar. That's where my, my, my parents grew up on it, right? So when I heard country music, I said, oh, yeah, I, I, I get it. It sounds very familiar to me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's my time. Thank you so much for your attention. We'll catch you next week, God willing. See you then. Bye.